Our scripture lesson for today is Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 through 14. Would you please stand as you are able for the reading of scripture? The Lord's power overcame me, and while I was in the Lord's spirit, he led me out and set me down in the middle of a certain valley. It was full of bones. He led me through them all around, and I saw that there were a great many of them on the valley floor, and they were very dry. He asked me, Human one, can these bones live again? I said, Lord God, only you know. He said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, Dry bones! Hear the Lord's word. The Lord God proclaims to these bones, I am about to put breath in you, and you will live again. I will put sinews on you, place flesh on you, and cover you with skin. When I put breath in you and you come to life, you will know that I am the Lord. I prophesy just as I was commanded, There was a great noise as I was prophesying, then a great quaking, and all the bones came together, bone by bone. When I looked, suddenly there were sinews on them. The flesh appeared, and they were covered over with skin, but there was still no breath in them. He said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, human one. Say to the breath, the Lord God proclaims, Come from the four winds, breathe. Breathe into these dead bones and let them live. I prophesied just as he commanded me. When the breath entered them, they came to life and stood on their feet, an extraordinarily large company. He said to me, Human one, these bones are the entire house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely finished. So now prophesy and say to them, The Lord God proclaims, I am opening your graves. I will raise you up from your graves, my people, and I will bring you to Israel's fertile land. You will know that I am the Lord. When I open when I open your graves and raise you up from your graves, my people, I will put my breath in you and you will live. I will plant you on your fertile land and you will know that I am the Lord. I've spoken and I will do it. This is what the Lord says. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to to God. God. Please be seated. Will you all pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'd like to tell you the story of an inventor. We'll call him Alva. Alva was a smart young lad who was always tinkering around with bits and bobs and making fun little inventions. But as Alva grew up, up through elementary, middle school, high school, college, he didn't seem to grow out of this little inventor stage and actually started making products. He worked on telegraph lines, updating them to be able to carry telegraphs in multiple directions at one time, quite the achievement, and even opened an invention studio so all of his friends could come and tinker with him. One day, he had an idea so crazy, even his friends laughed at him. Alva wanted to find a way to light up a room without having to use a candle. So he worked. 
Years and years he toiled on this idea. Something so innovative, nobody could quite believe it. His friends laughed and said, an electric candle would never work. But Alva had a vision of a world yet to come where his invention would be in homes across the nation, maybe even the world. Alva kept going and eventually perfected his invention and debuted it to the world. Thomas Alva Edison created the brilliant light bulb and completely altered how we light our spaces. Have you ever felt like our inventor friend Alva? Ever have an idea and people say it simply can't be done? Ever have a vision so clear of what could be and all you have to do is bring it into reality? Then you, my friend, are a prophet. When you think about it, Inventors are not too different from the narrator of our scripture this morning, Ezekiel, and his calling as a prophet. Inventors, like prophets, use their imagination and courage to take their ideas and visions given to them by God and bring them into reality. Now, Ezekiel is given a vision of from God of exceptional new life that only he can see. And it's become his job to share this great news of this new life with a spiritually dead and exiled Hebrew people. I can only imagine listening to Ezekiel's message as one of those exiled Hebrews. They might have thought, Valley of Dry Bones, huh? God sure has a sense of humor, calling us a valley of dry bones. Dry, dusty bones forgotten so long that they've become bleached in the sun, not even a proper tomb to put them in. God's so-called chosen people, forgotten in Babylon. We are those dry bones. We have forgotten our God, the God of our ancestors for so long that this is our rightly deserved punishment, exile. Some of us have already been here for years, and Ezekiel prophesied that if Jerusalem didn't get its act together, we would be stuck out here for 70 more years. And we just got the news that Jerusalem's been sacked. Sounds like we're going to be here for a while. Away from our homeland, away from our cemeteries, away from our only place of worship, the temple. God has abandoned us. But Ezekiel's not done talking. He says that this valley of dry bones is going to come to life. He prophesied over the bones all laid out where you can't tell where one skeleton ends and another begins. They're coming together, those bones, the Hebrew people. Me, us, are going to be revived? The ligaments are coming together, the skin's back on them, but there's still no breath. You know, this is starting to sound a lot like a creation story. God doing something miraculous and making humans out of the dirt, the dust, the dry, dusty bones. And Ezekiel's not done. God tells Ezekiel to again prophesy to the bones and tell the wind, the spirit, the ruach, the very spirit of God who was there at creation to come into the bodies and bring life into them. But I just can't believe it. Mm -mm. We're too dead, we're too dry, we're too dusty here. If we think about it, How often do we feel like those folks in exile, like a pile of dry, dusty bones waiting for God to revive us? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us if Ezekiel got any feedback, like my imagined Hebrew, or if the community's response dissuaded him at all. He is too busy prophesying the good news that God has given him to share with God's people. 
Ezekiel is prophesying about a new day, a time when all of the Hebrews would no longer be in exile. Their captors will be overthrown and they will return to their homeland once again, where the nations of the people of God will once again be united and they will be God's chosen people. But Hannah, you say, this is not for me. I'm not the prophesying type. God does not give me grand visions of rolling wheels and animals with four heads, nor does God tell me to do strange sign acts like lie on one side of my body for an entire year, stuff like God told Ezekiel to do. I am not a prophet. Well, I'd have to agree with you. You are not Ezekiel the prophet. I'm not Ezekiel the prophet. But I do think I am Hannah the prophet. I have a unique vision from God that seems pretty unrealistic right now, but I'm going to keep sharing it and working to make it real. I have a vision from God that one day at the church, the capital C church, all those who see themselves as a member of the body of Christ, the church, will no longer be polarized. Our pews will be filled with people across the political landscape. Our small groups will be filled with people who have different opinions on how the Bible should be interpreted. But because they love each other enough, they will be brave enough to sharpen each other like iron and study the Bible together. Our church councils will be filled with people who might disagree politically, but agree that this church needs to be run well and for the interest of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, not out of interest of keeping our carpets clean. I have a vision that churches in every community will pool their resources and work together to achieve more change than they could individually because they are willing to be united around their love of Christ and neighbor and not separated by minute theological differences. I have a vision that our churches will be diverse, mirroring the diversity in their communities that they are in, And through all of this, I have a vision of love. That love will be the driving force of all of our actions, not the desire to maintain the status quo. That love for sibling and Christ will overpower the love of political party, and we will once again see neighbor as neighbor, not as adversary. That the celebration of diversity that Paul talks about in Corinthians, where an eye cannot tell a hand it is unimportant because it is different, is actually modeled in the body of Christ here on earth. That's my vision from God. And when I look out over the valley of dry bones of our sectarian and polarized context, I see a vision of new life. And I know. I stand before you, the young seminarian who wants to completely change the political and relational landscape. How unrealistic. But I also stand before you as the product of the prophetic imagination of others who faithfully witness to what new life God has in store for us, if only we would take it. I'd like to tell you uh, the story, the story of a little church called Wayne Hills United Methodist Church in Waynesboro, Virginia. A sweet, one-story church, not much larger than the first floor of this building here. Its congregation was never large by any means, but always had a core of faithful saints who gathered for generations. They sang hymns in the sanctuaries, gathered for meals in the kitchen, hosted their small groups in the six classrooms that they had that included the office. But over time, nobody new joined this group of saints. Their older matriarchs and patriarchs went on to be with the Lord, and the congregation refused to take any major steps to make themselves welcoming to visitors. Years passed. Their numbers continued to dwindle. And eventually, the congregation made the heartbreaking call to close their church. 
The property was handed over to the Stanton District of the Virginia Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. And the district began to wonder what to do with this itty-bitty church on a city block's worth of land, basically in the middle of the city. Should they sell it? I mean, it would make a pretty penny that could be easily reinvested into the community. But a brave and prophetic soul, the Reverend Janelle Watson, one of my dear mentors, and the person I want to be like when I grow up, pleaded with the district to not sell the church. You see, Janelle and her youth group had been running a clothes closet out of one of the classrooms in that little church and had grand visions of how the entire building could be used. Now, this clothes closet was not an ordinary clothes closet. It was a cool one. This closet was made by teens for teens, and the vision was simple. Give underprivileged youth a dignified opportunity to receive brand name clothes to help mitigate the bullying that they were receiving based on their appearance. How it worked is that local schools guidance counselors can make referrals for students who they saw being bullied for their appearance, and those students could discreetly come to the secret boutique and shop through the new and gently used brand name clothes and select what they want. No pre-selected bags of clothes or trying to assume what a person's favorite colors were. No, it was set up like a store with racks and carts and changing rooms where students could shop around, try things on, and leave in clothes that they felt confident in. Well, the district granted Janelle's request. A ministry like this cannot easily be quelled. And the empty church building was now hers. This empty, dusty, quiet church on an entire city block might have seen very much like a valley of dry bones. But Janelle had been called by God to prophesy to those dry, dusty bones and cause new life, new breath, new ruach to come into the body. First, through countless hours of listening deeply to the needs of the community, work from countless volunteers, support from local community foundations, and the support from the district and conference offices, the former Wayne Hills UMC building is now the ministry known as Embrace, a center for community. And let me tell you, there is always new life sprouting up at Embrace. The Secret Boutique is celebrating its 10th year of operation. They have free medical clinics twice a month for the community, a free community garden where folks can come and take whatever is ripe. They rent out rooms to a legal assistance group who help folks who are new to the country navigate our legal system, an ecumenical dinner church held weekly, and their newest project is an affordable housing community on their property. These houses will be for community members experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness. And a few of those homes will be reserved for folks who are discharged from the hospital and have nowhere to go except back on the street. They're even expanding this model to reach other areas of Virginia where there are empty church buildings and great community need. And this ministry is proof that new life can come out of the valleys of death and stagnation. So what's your vision? What's your vision to heal our broken world that sounds just a little crazy when you say it out loud? Perhaps that vision has come from none other than God Almighty himself. Sometimes we're so busy mourning those dry bones of our beloved past that we end up missing God calling us to take those pieces and invent something new, something life-giving. What are the bits and bobs that you see lying around that God is calling you to invent something new with? Are there any here at Millbrook? Are there any areas in the church that aren't being used to their fullest potential for fear that they might get dirty? 
So they sit, empty, collecting dust. What are some activities, maybe, that we do here that just don't fit this congregation's needs anymore, but we just keep doing them because that's how we've always done it? Where can God breathe new life into Millbrook so that we can be the best version of ourselves so we can make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? After all, God has shown us time and time again a little death, a little dust is nothing that God can't handle. We are a resurrection people. We serve a God who raised Jesus up from the dead and brought new life to all who would have it. We serve a God who isn't afraid of death because God knows what comes after. I'm going to say it again. We serve a God who isn't afraid of death because he knows what comes after. So take courage. If God has been nudging you to see the life that can come from your valley of dry bones, prophesy over them dry, dusty bones. They ain't doing you much good when they're sitting around collecting dust. But if you have a vision, an imagined future that only you can see for how that pile of dry, dusty, dead dirt can be revived, speak life into it. Act in a way that God will bring new life into it. Be like Ezekiel, who didn't just prophesy once over those bones and walked away, said it was too hard, can't be done, but stuck around and was courageous enough to prophesy again when God told him to, so that life could come back into those bodies. Have courage. Prophesy over those bones and prophesy over them again until new life has sprung out where only others could only see death. For we are a resurrection people and we aren't afraid of death because we serve a God who knows what happens next. Thanks be to God. <laughs>